Um, I really am grateful for each of these speakers. They've been working very hard to put this together and also with the challenges technologically, I apologize for that, but they've all been good sports. We're gonna move on now with the next panel, which is about deal-making, piloting, and scaling. Do you have what it takes? And we have a really interesting group of speakers who are gonna help us understand better from the company side how to sell, pilot, and scale successfully within the healthcare system. And on the other side of the equation, from the healthcare system, I'm hoping to learn a lot as well as to how do we facilitate these processes and gain some economy of scale so that people don't feel like they're starting over each time they're trying to make these things happen. And I'd like to introduce now the moderator, Travis Good, who is the CEO and co-founder of Catalyze, as well as Molly Coy, who's the former Chief Innovation Officer at UCLA, and currently she's the Social Entrepreneur in Residence at Nehi, which I'll let her explain, because I'm so old I think it's some sort of a soft drink. And then Adam Odesky, who's the co-founder and CEO of Sensely. So thank you very much. Okay, um, fantastic. So my mic is on. That was pretty easy. Um, well, I wanted to thank everybody for sticking around uh, this Friday afternoon. Thank you, CSF, for hosting the event, and Jill and the Digital Health Summit uh, for coordinating and putting on uh, such, a, such a fantastic day, and, and I guess multiple days with the event last night as well. Um, we just did kind of brief intros there, so we know who everybody is. But um, I'm going to throw it out to Adam to give just a little bit more background on himself and then we'll kind of jump into some discussion and questions. Sure. My name is Adam Odesky. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sensely. Uh, we're a virtual nurse platform that helps uh, physicians better manage their chronically ill patients. My background is primarily in engineering, so software development, and I also got an MBA later and worked at big behemoth software companies like Oracle and Microsoft, so I bring a slightly different angle to the healthcare <laughs> enterprise. But uh, really, uh, it's been a really fascinating journey for us, and uh, it's continuing on. OK, perfect. And I can do Molly's really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll do the abbreviated version. She's got quite the interesting background. Uh, but she was the Chief Innovation Officer at UCLA Health for the past five years until about two weeks ago with her new position where she's a social entrepreneur in residence uh, at the Network for the... Network for Excellence in Healthcare Innovation. It's a, it basically, that focuses on research mm -hmm. and policy, but my being the social entrepreneur in residence, just like entrepreneur in residence in a private equity firm now, yeah. is really bringing the experience of the real world to those folks. Fantastic. And as I said, I'm Travis Good. I'm a CEO, co-founder of Catalyze. Uh, we work with a broad range. We offer a, um, a cloud-based platform specifically for healthcare and work with a broad range of companies all the way down to developers, startups, all the way up to large enterprises like the VA, insurance companies, and pharmaceutical companies. So we have direct experience securing pilots and taking those to scale as well as indirect experience through our customers that are selling products to some of the biggest enterprises, uh, healthcare enterprises in the world. Um, and so the intent here is just to kick off a discussion uh, with both Adam and, and Molly, or Dr. Coy. Um, <laughs> Well, you got to do it once. So. I, I, I haven't seen a patient so long I'd be dangerous. <laughs> so. All right. Well, um, so go ahead and kick it off with Molly. Ask mm -hmm. you, uh, putting back on your chief innovation yeah, officer right. hat from two yeah. weeks ago that you took off at UCLA, um, how you go about evaluating um, new solutions and new systems right, that right. come to UCLA. Well, I'm going to set aside the idea of partnering very early stage for something very complex technologically mm -hmm. because that's a bigger deal for most health systems than is easy to contemplate in the short run. So really the first thing, it, oops, the first thing that we're looking for is we're looking for someone who's bringing us a solution rather than just being able to describe the problem to us. Because a lot of times people have a technology and they're trying to find why that should be good and they don't really understand the problem that they think it's trying to solve. So walking through the door and being able to say, within 12 to 24 months, we can shift the needle for you on something that really matters to you. Mm -hmm. That is, and if, if you just have one trial that shows very suggestive evidence that that's likely to happen, mm -hmm. we would be all over that. But if you come in and you say, look at this great technology, it has promise in all these areas, that's a, a, a longer developmental path. And we've done that, but not nearly as often. It's not a quick path to anything. Interesting. And so I kind of have the same question for you, Adam, because uh, I, I, the Karen, the CEO or co-founder of Ginger, uh, earlier today was mm -hmm. talking about them also evaluating customers for fit. And, and there's been a lot of talk, as, as I think everybody now has mentioned, 
uh, around partnering and, and creating those partnerships as a way, a path to success. And you know, we talked about it with Airstrip and some of the others, that's, they kind of built those early relationships. How do you think about evaluating opportunities? I think we have a tendency as, as, as entrepreneurs or, or startups and small ventures just to say, okay, we're gonna get any contract we can right. get. But I don't think that's really the right approach. So I'm curious how you think about it. Yeah, I think the most important thing is really find the, the right fit for the long term. And that's what we're always kind of hunting down. And, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward to go to a hospital because there's so many here in the U.S. And, you know, convince that you have a great technology, that you are sol solving a problem, and get some kind of a short-term pilot where, you know, you're, you're, you're almost guaranteed to get pretty good results that you could market and you can create great PR around. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of where you get stuck in the phase of kind of pilotitis in a way where PR or like just some great like short-term results only gets you a part of the way and then you're kind of back at square one. So we, what we are looking for, uh, you know, for companies, for enterprises, insur insurance companies, hospitals, think, you know, folks to partner with, we're looking at around like what does their organization actually look like? How do the uh, how do the operations of that organization actually look like? Where we can add true value, and not just true value in the intermediate term, but where we can add true value for the long term. Mm -hmm. Is is there a place where we can pilot initially? Is there a specific set of guidelines and uh, metrics that they have in mind that will allow us to get to that next level? Mm -hmm. And what does that next level look like? Is it going to help us, you know, you know, expand inside? You know that particular organization does this help help us get a reference for repeatability in other organizations? Is it going to help us with our investors? Where yeah. it's going to be mm -hmm. a solid deal that we can go back and say, hey, we have a, a really good reference here to warrant further investment. I can give an example. Very much agree with that. I can give an example. Parahelp is a youngish company mm -hmm. that's taking basically the Rothman Index and applying it with technology integrated with Epic, and our problem of controlling length of stay and complications mm -hmm. made us sitting ducks for that and for a long-term partnership because what we see is the potential, if, it, if it's working for us, 20 other hospitals in our immediate area will want to put it in and potentially do co-management mm -hmm. where we share consulting and, and expertise in subspecialty areas. And so it is made for that kind of long-term partnership, but it has to have First of all, in that health system, you have to have executives that understand the difference between pilotitis and actually deploying at scale and are willing to commit the budget and the staff saying if that pilot is successful, these are the 12 months, 24 month uh, plans for actually um, getting it out there. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs kind of falling into that pitfall where, you know, especially with a very early stage company, you just want to get your technology or your product out there for somebody to try out. Mm -hmm. And they're a little, I think they're afraid and I think we were victims of that as well, afraid of kind of getting Pushing into that negotiation that, yeah. where say, what does this really mean for yeah. you long term? Yeah. I think that's an important conversation to have really early on. Yeah, yeah I agree. So, and, and it, it also sounds like, uh, I mean, obviously starting with a pilot, especially as a young company. Do you, and so, Adam, again, to you, do you typically approach organizations, um, you know, with a pilot in mind? Or do you kind of pitch the whole <laughs> kit and caboodle? Yeah, I, th I think we approach, in, in general, mm -hmm. in, these uh, conversations have kind of varied as, as we've evolved. We've approached um, an organization with several ideas mm -hmm. based on what our thesis was that that organization needed, based on our previous experience with other organizations, we basically gave them kind of like an a, la carte, a limited a la carte menu of three mm -hmm. or four ideas. You know, it could be implemented this way, this way, and this way, and kind of get a sense for, you know, through bringing those examples, what they're actually looking for, what their uh, crucial pain point was, and how we can potentially fulfill that pain point. Yeah. And you know, it's, if you're, if you're a, an early stage company with you know, uh, a not so complete product, that you're still looking to evolve the product and learn along with your customers, you, know, you have to kind of bring that kind of uh, long term or innovation kind of thinking to bring that vision of what you actually want this product to evolve eventually, and then try to negotiate, try to come to uh, an agreement for where it could be. But spurring that kind of thinking um, mm -hmm. on the customer side, on the hospital side, is very important yeah. early on. I do think there's a big difference. Most of the technologies we're talking about and the companies we're talking about are, would fall in the bucket of solving a problem, a pressing big problem. There also are opportunity companies, where it's mm -hmm. opening a market and opportunity that people didn't see before. Usually that means not such a problem of integrating into the existing work processes. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of Trinity just did a huge deal with ShareCare. 
Yeah. And basically, they're not replacing some work process they already have. They don't have much of a way except for a general marketing program mm -hmm. to reach the consumers in the community. And similarly, Providence is doing a whole build in the Northwest, yeah. is doing a whole build of a new consumer-facing outreach and communications. Those things aren't requiring epic integration initially. They're not replacing nurse work processes. Right. Yeah. And so in a sense, the, the threshold is not so high, and the revenue generation is all upside. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we, we've, you know, early on we had similar success where we would target almost, you could think of it like around the periphery of the organization, and we target a lot of things around, you know, well, it was mentioned in the last presentation, every slide has innovation in it. But, you know, we talk a lot about innovation, and, you know, we're not talking about replacing a core system, you know, coming in and replacing Epic, right, right? Yeah. or, you know, something like that. Um, and that's been incredibly effective for us to start building those relationships. And they're smaller contracts. But again, for organizations that are thinking about patient mm -hmm. engagement and, um, and, and, and mobile health and sort of all these buzzwords that everybody's talking about, it's kind of a great way to penetrate the organization and learn a lot more about the organization. So that, that, that's been a highly effective tool for us, and I think we've seen it with a lot of our customers as well. I was just going to um, kind of add something around kind of the, the, the previous gentleman mentioned this fortress kind of idea yeah. of like there's so many different constituencies <laughs> yeah. in place that you have to get through and kind of prove value to it. The initial, you know, as an early stage company, the initial conversations you have in, in digital health is typically sort of adopters. You come in there and say, I have, you know, I have a product, we have a product that's, you know, going to make your work easier, that's going to make your patients, uh, mm -hmm. you know, get better faster. And, mm -hmm. that, and you get the doctor really excited about that product. It's like, okay, I believe this is something that's really going to work, is going to help my life. But that's just kind of that initial entry point mm -hmm. into, into the system. You have to go and convince all these other folks, and they all have slightly different you know, things that they're looking for. The revenue side, people are actually looking at their spreadsheets, yeah. trying to figure out, is this going to save me money quarter after quarter after quarter? You know, yeah. The IT folks are going to be looking at security, looking at you know, how is this going to be deployed and integrated. Mm -hmm. And so you almost have to have a different product value proposition for every single one, and you have to think about that ahead of time. To really yeah, I would agree, and I think one of the things I wanted to one of the things I wanted to touch on, which is related to that and some of the stuff we were mentioning earlier, is you know everybody's talking about this inevitable shift. They started the day actually talking about the inevitable shift to value-based care, right? Which you know, right, like right, the, right. the trains and left the some station. Some people say that it's in past tense, which yeah, yeah, is yeah. just crazy. Exactly, <laughs> but it, one of the one of the things that one of the things you hear over and over again as you talk to. Uh, as you talk to vendors, especially new vendors, or you talk to groups, innovation groups within organizations, is um, creating solutions or technology-enabled solutions that, one, you know, enable that transition mm -hmm. to value-based care, while at the same time not putting the organization that's on a very slim margin out of business today, right? right? So you're kind of, you have to build yeah, a system yeah. that appeals to both, right. or build a solution that appeals to both systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, you know, if you guys have any examples that you've seen of that uh, in terms oh, of success. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't. It's not yet um, past the brink of success, but I think it's, <laughs> it's really going to make it. The example I gave of ParaHealth. Yeah. In in other words, basically, hospitals that have even modestly decent occupancy want to control the mm -hmm. length of stay. You know, you definitely want to clear for more surgical cases. You want to reduce yeah. the stay for Medicare, non-complex cases, that kind of thing. And para-health helps you with that, but then if you were doing population health-based, a risk-based mm -hmm. reimbursement, you could just put the pedal to the metal and really carry that through mm -hmm. much more deeply. So I think it's a little bit, um, a little bit different emphasis, though, than you were saying in that I think that's the most important thing right now. There are a small number of products that really should just stay with population health and push only on that basis and can't make it unless you've got a risk-based mm -hmm. reimbursement. But most health systems in the country, if you're not selling to Kaiser and Group Health, you know, most health systems in the com country are not above 25, 30% capitated yeah. or significantly. I mean, there's a lot of value-based repayment out there that would never lead a CFO to actually invest <laughs> in anything because it's reconciliation 18 months, 24 months yeah. down the road where the government changes their mind about what the basis for reconciliation is. They're not going to invest in something that's going right. to significantly reduce utilization. Yeah. So. Right. I mean, I was just going to speak from the, the, the point of value-based care, care being such a huge aggregate. Yeah. Right, everybody talks about value-based care. What does mm -hmm. value-based care typically mean? And when we talk to folks, like, is it, they ask us, does this provide kind of value-based care? Is this going to, you know? And even if you split it up, like flip the bits, people are talking about yeah. reduced readmissions. That's like the first kind of yeah. 
big, big swing and splitting value-based care into a part. And even that is such a, such a very, very large aggregate that yeah. it's very, very hard to fathom kind of like how you're actually going to do it, especially if you're a small company, you have maybe six months to do a pilot. It's hard to prove that you're going to reduce readmissions within six months, yeah. especially that's something that's kind of financially meaningful. And so what you know, we end up kind of doing in a lot of our conversations, we start splitting various kind of metrics together and assigning certain metrics to mm -hmm. value-based care. This is actually going to help lead the way towards reducing your readmissions. This is going to lead the way to getting additional reimbursements, like these new telemedicine mm -hmm. reimbursements. And so we're talking about things like, are we communicating with the patients more? Are we gathering more data from the patients? Is the velocity of the patient-doctor communication path getting, you know, getting, mm -hmm. getting increased? Are the number of like red alerts that come through that are actually meaningful versus all the other alerts getting uplifted and yeah. up leveled? Yeah. And so all those kind of little things, if you break it down, then it starts making sense when you actually start putting that into these complicated co uh, calculations that go into uh, kind of creating that aggregate. Okay. And yeah, and you're defining those metrics up front, like you yeah, said, before exactly. the pilot starts. So fast forward ahead six months, you've completed this pilot, right? And it's maybe a small, if you're a small company, it's probably a pretty small pilot. Um, or maybe it's not, but um, how do you think about the difference from going from pilot to scale? I mean, I feel like we've seen some significant differences in terms of expectations with integration or workflow integration. If you're going to have, if you're going to deploy something a little more wide scale and have it be adopted, we've seen differences in terms of what they look like in you know security and compliance and other pieces. Uh, but I'd be curious to get uh, both of your perspectives on on the difference between the yeah. two. Well, first of all, I think innovation officers can be very dangerous because <laughs> and innovation <laughs> programs because in some organizations they're sort of isolated mm -hmm. and they get permission to do a pilot. And they don't have, they may have brilliant metrics because the company and the innovation officer agreed on the metrics. But you, if you didn't have an operations lead in the room agreeing to that, yeah. you're dead. Yeah. And if you run a successful pilot with sort of detailed people working with you and it's kind of under this little cone, <laughs> then, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. So I really would argue very strongly that... And we developed, actually, if anyone is interested, you can go to uclainnovates.org, and we have a report on our five years of innovation. It's an ebook that mm -hmm. anybody can get access to. There's an innovation transformation model in there that says that you have to have significant operations involvement from the beginning of the pilot. And if you do that, where you're actually talking about what the rollout will be, even as you're designing it with mm -hmm. the people who would be leading that, mm -hmm. you're way ahead of the game. And I, so I just, I mean, I'm being a little flip about the innovation officers being <laughs> dangerous. But, well, you're you know, not one anymore. There's so. too much of a, you can have too much yeah. of a good thing, you know. So I, mean, I, I would agree with what you're saying. And I think the whole definition of a pilot, the way it's thought about, especially for early, early stage companies, could be a little different. Obviously, like the innovation officer, sometimes they typically be a doctor or mm -hmm. somebody that sees real clinical value in what you're doing. And they, in their primary interest, like, okay, how do I have the six-month pilot to pr prove the clinical value, which ver could yeah. be very, very against the interest of the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. because they're going to, like, just use you right. up and kind of throw you out in the end. Uh, so, like, or what I recommend to early stage entrepreneurs is kind of setting up, like, a three, uh, a three-tiered roadmap. There's a clinical roadmap of how this pilot is going to mm -hmm. run to prove mm -hmm. the clinical outcomes. There's an IT roadmap, how this pilot is going to roll mm -hmm. out and eventually integrate with the whole IT workflow of, you know, mm -hmm. integrating with yeah. medical records and other systems. And that's all financial roadmap. Mm -hmm. How is this pilot going to evolve into meeting the metrics, not just that are meaningful in the aggregate economic sense, yeah. but in the specific kind of revenue cycle economic sense for that specific organization? And that has to be really thought through very well. That's really good. I would just add operations mm -hmm. because the administrative, not the clinical, but the administrative folks who actually have to run the rollout and run implementing it in all the different settings, right. I think they need to be added too. Yeah, that's a, yeah the, the multiple roadmap is a... That's a good one. Um, I haven't heard anybody actually setting those up beforehand <laughs> as part of a six-month pilot, but that's a good yeah. approach. Um, okay. Um, so again, back to sort of that transition. You know, I, I, in our experience, it feels like uh, there's a much lower bar from a, not a technology perspective even, but as an organization when you're starting as a pilot as opposed to scale. And there are certain things that when you start to go more broadly um, within an organization, um, that they start to look at. And there are some interesting factors as a, as a startup that they look at, like the size of your organization, mm -hmm. the maturity, how much money you've raised, mm -hmm. um, which I, 
kind of an interesting um, advantage that you have being on the, on the West Coast versus, <laughs> <laughs> versus companies in other parts of the country. Um, but I'm curious if you, yeah. in your experience, yeah. sort of use the same type of things to evaluate companies right. as they went to that. Well, I think that, that the same people who would bring a company in and do a pilot are usually mm -hmm. not capable of assessing a young company's strength to carry mm -hmm. it to scale. Because if you think about it, most people who are involved, like their operations inside a health system or the innovation doctor mm -hmm. or something like that, they don't know how to look at the strength of the company in terms of their management, their yeah. investment, yeah. their ability to scale and all that kind of thing. So we're seeing the emergence of a whole industry of facilitators around that. I mean, they're often called accelerators, but UCLA is a member of Avia. Mm -hmm. And Avia helps cohorts of us look at a problem area we're interested in and dive in and actually do that analysis. And they go off, because they have background in investment mm -hmm. too, and they can come back and say, you know, here are three companies, and this one is pretty thin on management. This one has you know, built and sold two or three different companies. Mm -hmm. So I think, think carefully. It's not just about whether you as a company are capable of doing that. It's can they tell the difference? Right. And you may want to help them understand yeah. that, look, we, we've got stripes. We could actually do this. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would totally agree with what you're saying. I think, sending, first of all, sending those signals, as you mentioned, about the stability of the company, yeah. about the, the size of the company, its technical depth, its clinical mm -hmm. depth is, is crucial and very important, especially in these kind of early stage pilots. But, you know, you do need to understand, uh, you know, the, 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 the clinic or the hospital does need to understand, even early on, what that growth trajectory is for the company. Mm -hmm. Or do they have other customers? Right that are doing similar things, they have repeatability in their product. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work out for us, are they right. going to be able to survive? Or are they well, pouring and, all their resources yeah, exactly. in us? Yeah, that's why this is maybe such a good idea, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. right. yeah. Well, I didn't imagine this would be an advertisement for accelerators, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, you asked. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it makes sense. Uh, I think we are over. So. Yeah. <laughs> we could probably sit here and talk about this all day because it is definitely one of the biggest questions and biggest issues that people have is how do we do it? So um, it's a great opening to that conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having us. Thank you, all of you.